You guys should see the slides. Good. Yeah. Okay. All right. I hear noise, but I can't tell you. We starting. Go ahead. Once in a while, a product comes along that is truly out of the ordinary. Micropin is such a product, not a toy. You might have thought it was one. Micropin is more than a miniature electronic pinball machine. It is a tribute to the solid state art and electronics. Micropin is world extraordinary. And I'm not going to read the whole thing, but you see that these people had a very high set of hopes for this game that we're going to talk about, this kind of detective mystery of uh, this forgotten little game. Uh, yes, it does look different from any other pinball machine you've ever seen. It's a stainless steel exterior, and it's quality, although a kind of funny quality you're going to see in a minute here. One to four players, as you would full expect, with full memory, and in fact memory in a way that we still don't have in modern games, as we'll talk to a minute about. Oh. Um, it calculates a point spread because, as everybody knows, the main way people play are players one and three versus two and four. This game, a lot of the engineering went into doing just that. Um, high scores, LEDs displayed and kept in memory. Resets the high score for 200 plays. It, in theory, adjusts the volume based on how loud the, loud the room is. It has a two-level tilt mechanism, and one of them is tilt till you turn off the plug. We'll see that maybe a little later. Um, one theme you see in this game is that they want to make this game never need maintenance. And we'll talk a little bit about their history and how they did that. Um, and it, uh, it optionally can take quarters, right? Because you know, that's something you may or may not want in a coin-operated op game. Because Micropin is a coin-free coin-op game. Um, if you, We'll see in a little later that the onus on who controls how much money goes in the game is the operator or the bartender behind here. He has a full console, which we'll see in a little bit. And then he manually adds credits to the game and has a full view of the action from behind there. Uh, it solves a lot of problems and some that probably didn't need to be solved. For instance, why have artwork? I mean, you know everyone's going to get tired of Alt Dolly Parton and want Evil Knievel. Why not have no art at all? And, and then the game becomes timeless and never needs repair, perpetual money machine. Uh, in theory, maintenance free. You're gonna see all the features it has that eliminates the need for a lot of the pinball things you're gonna need. It has no legs and no GI. Let's <laughs> see what that, no general illumination. As I've owned this thing and looked at it, what I've learned is it's kind of a combination of Things, you know, one of the favorite things about being an engineer is laughing at bad engineering. Like if you look at conversations at work, almost all the laughing ones are about bad engineering. And there's plenty of that here. But there's also like some really cool ideas that are ahead of their time. Um, one of the things you think about is one half, which is what this game is. Half scale means one eighth of the volume, right? So your ball weight goes down by eight, one eighth, which means you don't need very large solenoids to propel the ball anymore. Which means, in theory, it's one-eighth the weight. It's not. It's a third the weight. That sucker's 60 pounds. Um, <clears throat> and, um, it's a, and, and so it's, it's kind of this combination of things. And that's why I've been so fascinated with this. Um, here's my story of it. So that's Jerry and I at Pal Pacific Pinball Expo. Someone took that picture of us on the day I learned about Micropin. Later on, I figured out who probably took that picture, and I don't think it was taken with the best of intentions. But still, there's this picture of us playing Micropin from a compromised angle. But um, I played this at Pacific Pinball X once, and I need to have this, and it took eight years of eBay searches to find it. Um, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but this is a picture of the lamp. When I first got the game, it didn't have that lamp on there. And uh, I was after the coin uh, box, which I think I've got a picture. I don't have a picture of here. Um, there's a flyer that shows a coin box, an external one, because again, this doesn't take money. There's a way for it to hook up on the back with a couple of wires, and then it'll trigger credits. And I say, hey, do you have the coin box? No, but see this metal shaft thing? You couldn't see this part. I think we have that, and that's the lamp. And that was like pay dirt. That was like the moment of like, oh my gosh, the holy dirt. So this is the lamp that they came up with, and we'll talk about the lamp as we go. That's their picture sending it to me. All right, I just want to do this timeline. Rewind to 1972. Um, the first 8-bit processor hits the streets. All right, only two years later, the people who did this game start engineering on it. 1974. 
That's way ahead of Micro Games Spirit of 76. That's way ahead of uh, Rock On by Allied Leisure. Certainly ahead of Fireable Home Model. These guys deserve some credit for being really early, not only in uh, electronic pinball, but in exploiting microprocessors. I mean, that deserves some credit if you're gonna take you know, chips that just came out of Intel two years earlier, not, not, not inexpensive either, and build a design about it. Well, they took from here all the way to here to get a product built. Um, if you go downstairs, you'll see that we actually have a slightly different micro bin. Somewhere in here, they completed what we call V1. And I show the Motorola symbol on here for a minute. It's a slightly different version of this game. Um, the play field's almost identical. It has fewer scoring features. And it's all, in, it's all made for a, a Motorola platform. At some point, they went from this game, and about a year later, to producing the one you have here. Again, the same game, same layout, almost the same exact features, but Intel. So the whole thing got re-engineered for the production quantity of 200. Think about that. If you, ever, if you do engineering, think about how much work you did to get to here, and you're going to start over and get almost nothing else and make 100 games. Of course, they didn't know that they would um, run out of steam. Uh, Right around 1980, 1980, a whole bunch of things happen in the industry, right? That's Space Invaders, the dust has settled on that. There's the thinking that video games are the future. Um, but they aren't giving up yet. They IPO in 1980. You can look up MicroPin. They were on the NASDAQ as MPIN slash Anna. At one, they appear at one time to have been called Anna, Annadale Corp. Before that, EAD Corp. These are all parts of this little detective mystery I keep getting pieces and parts from, from ex-employees and, and things I dig up. But they do go public. They sell a million and a half shares at three bucks. Which I just want to kind of take a moment for any of us who are like, been in startups, that kind of thing. Hitting the street with a market cap of four and a half million dollars. It's like something out of Austin Powers. Like who, who thinks about a four and a half million dollar company and that much engineering horsepower to build this? It just, you know, you need that to build a pet, you know, a, a, a dog food uh, yeah. website now. Um, the founders got about a third and in 1980 they lost about 650 grand. 1981, they lost a little less, 237k, made 155k. I really want to know. I do the math here. How many, how much money they made on that? Um, but by 1982, things are looking up, and we'll see that it's not what you think. Uh, but they supposedly clear 200k in 1982 on a revenue of 1.3 million, which isn't too bad in ROI. But they've also acquired Elcon. Has anybody heard of Elcon before? Okay, Elcon, and I've got a little bits and pieces on Elcon as we go. Elcon's kind of a forgotten, you know, Ram Tech kind of like B, B, B movie kind of uh, income. And they stopped production at that point. Just real quick, the founders, there are three people. One, only one I can find information on. These are their stock holdings. So you can see there's a Joel Heinrich, Thomas Spiel, and Robert Bruce Stewart. And his name shows up on all the IPO paperwork, etc. He's the figurehead. That's his picture. You can find him on LinkedIn. I, he's been involved in a lot of things. He seems like a polymath, really interesting guy. It would be great to meet him, assuming he's still around. You'll find little random comments on YouTube. There's people out there that worked or knew, had parents that worked there. Um, but it's still hard. Uh, <clears throat> Ken's hot on the trail of a guy we, this close to getting an interview for today, but we're still sort of forming that picture. I mentioned some of the features already. For one thing, you can fit in the back of a Porsche. That's like, I don't know about any other pinball that you can say that about. The other thing is the only other pinball ever made with a pay bartender light on it, but this means someday I could come to California Extreme on a free ticket with a Porsche. And so that's, if I just get two more, I'm ready to go. Um, <clears throat> the flipper buttons are optos. There's four buttons of different sizes. It's all contactless switches. So it's all Hall Effect. There's no mechanical switches on the game at all. It's clear everything is designed here around the idea of like, I don't want to clean it. I don't want to change rubbers. I don't want to take it apart. I don't want to swap it for a different game. I just want this to plug in and work forever. And what's more, they were going to build it, operate it, and maintain it. Heck of this idea with distributors or operators, we're going to do the whole thing. It just speaks with naivety. Um, and uh, it's all stainless. 
The rule sheet is actually kind of cool. The reason why it's called pentacup is because there's five of these little cups. See these little circles? And that's kind of the main name of the game. You, the ball ejects out this way. There's some bumpers and things, but mainly you want to get them in the five pentacups, which then light the corresponding stand-up targets, because remember, there's no actual targets, it's just rollovers. And if you like this one, it lights this for like 5,000 points. So that's like the name of the game. You want to light all these to increase their value. It's actually a pretty good set of rules, considering this is a group of people who obviously have never been in the pinball industry before. Yet, it plays pretty good. When you lose the ball, you only get half the bonus. You get the full bonus, though, if you go into this little cup here. All kinds of fun quirks, and one really hard shot way up on top, which also can light for extra ball. But the thing, the takeaway I want you to have is like, this is actually a fairly fun game and a fairly nice design for their, their debut game, and again, by people who clearly were not industry experts. As I mentioned, like it's, got, it's really geared for a bar, and if you could see from behind here, you would see this. <coughs> They've built a whole console for the purpose of the bartender to help facilitate gameplay. Because again, it doesn't take money. Um, it has a button here where you can add credits. And this kind of odd mechanism, which somehow I think was designed to help indicate whether the people had paid or not. I'm not really sure. There's two keys here. <laughs> no one will guess this, but I'm just gonna. Can anyone guess what the keys might be for? Yeah. The rocket? No, that's what I thought. The keys are to set, oh, go ahead. I was just just to turn it on? Good to guess, but no. <laughs> They're, go ahead. Order drinks. <laughs> that would have been even better. Yeah, not ordering drinks, yeah. It's to set pricing on a game that doesn't take money. Down to the penny resolution. You can set the pricing on the game from one cent to 99 cent. And then you're wondering, well, but if it's not taking quarters, what are we actually doing then? And what it does is, every time I push the credit button here, it takes that number and adds it to an accumulator back here, just so I could read this and say, okay, Ken, I need $3.90 for those 10 games you just played. It's in the middle. Okay. Yeah, because this machine also has integrated PayPal. Um, I mean, you just kind of wonder, who spent all these engineering hours to build these features that no one would ever want? and then overlook having a, coins, uh, a, a, a coin map or any way to enter money. On the bottom here, uh, I mentioned the light before. This is kind of hard to see in here, but the light can be toggled to be off, on, or, or either one of the two lights, right? Because if your lights are off and you're in a bar, you're out of luck. So they thought of that. They said, okay, well, we forgot the GI, but we're not gonna screw this up. We're gonna have two lights and that way, no one's gonna call us and say no one can see you. I have never figured out what this little red LED is here in the middle, and I can't make it light up, but it is an LED. That's one of the mysteries that continue. But you can see in the back, you're like it's keeping track of the spread. If you have a one, a four player game, it'll actually keep track of like is team one or team two winning? Because again, every pinball player knows that's an essential way we all play. Uh, some oddball weird stuff, okay. What's that LED? Don't know. Um, this one, is, you guys can come up later, we'll see that the flippers are momentary. You can't hold them. But on Ken's game, they hold. Or even there's a YouTube of someone who has Ken's, uh, sorry, Ken, other Ken's game. Ken Cheney's game. Um, they ditched holdable flippers on this version, which really is unfortunate. I've wondered to see if I can hack the software to do that. I mentioned the Intel Motorola thing. There's actually a third version, which is slightly different from this one, which has a high score feature. Larry Gamar had that one. <clears throat> the adaptive volume, I've never gotten to work, but in theory, it can tell how loud the room is and make it louder or quieter. I did the pricing piece. Um, here's a funny one, okay. I mentioned the memory thing. If I unplug this game, and it's the third player, the second ball, and plug it back in, it's still the third player, second ball. So for all those tournaments in, you know, uh, 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 power dropout prone counties in the United States, this game's ready for you. This game will not lose a ball. Um, the downside with that is it doesn't seem very robust to losing memory. So if your battery gets trashed, I mentioned that at the end, uh, it doesn't like reboot itself cleanly. It kind of assumes there's holdover memory and it gets really lost. Um, tilt is one and done. 
It, once you tilt it, you have to unplug it, and it just makes a horrible, obnoxious sound. Um, and they, oh yeah, this, this game's really a human factor's triumph in almost no way. Uh, because no one walks up to this game and knows how, how to kick out the ball. A lot of people walk up to this and don't even know what it is. Um, it's, it's really trying to be, go down this kind of Bauhaus, super modern, artistic look. Um, and it's too hard for people to know what to do. This isn't going to work. Because we're not gonna work. Okay. For those six of us that own one, I prepared this slide. Um, they have this really crummy day-to-life battery like, like you've seen in the Gottlieb games. I'm going to skip that a little bit here. Right? These NICADs. And mine actually was still holding up for a while. But as I said, once that thing goes, uh, the game gets really confused. And so you need to change it out. I used a uh, super capacitor. Like, there's another, it's a similar how-to guide for Gottlieb's to do it. I used the same uh, capacitor in that work. Um, as Ken will mention, and uh, Kunzi mentioned a minute ago, the schematics are on the internet for version one, but not version two. So, uh, and I actually needed them for, to fix the score displays, and they sort of resemble them a little bit, but um, for the benefit of the five owners, I hope someone could ohm out the whole board for us and make us a new schematic because we're going to need that. Um, the dip switches are still a mystery. I have figured out that switch one toggles between when you get three or four balls a game. That is right, four, not five. And whether you get one or four credits per bartender switch is just kind of important because otherwise it always wants to start a four player game. Um, if you ever happen to take one of these apart, the edges of these are really delicate, like this, it's like some thin laminated material. And that blue stuff will peel. Um, Chris has, Chris has, has it real bad. Mine's starting on the corner. Takes super good care of it. And we mentioned the keys are in. Also, the, uh, the circuit boards, if you work with the Valley or Williams circuit board, those were kind of built for big rough and tumble people who just learned about electronics last week, right? I mean, that's, that's 1980 when that was probably their first introduction to using electronics. And those traces are fairly robust. They're really fine on, this, on these games. I mean, it takes some care to not lift those and, um, and to trace them, so unfortunately. Another care and feeding thing. I used to take the play field out. Here's some ribbon cables. Here's the play field standing up. I never realized till this picture, which I dug up a day or two, that this actually is designed to sit the play field on the end so when you're working on it, you don't have to set this somewhere and worry about the bottom half getting damaged. Uh, okay. Another picture here. You can hear their value proposition. They, want to, they, they were thinking about selling directly to bar owners, but I've read it elsewhere where they were just splitting the money like a normal operator would. Um, they're definitely touting that there are no switches, relays, or switches of any kind. You know, pretty interesting. Here's a patent for the light. You know they were proud. They were like, oh, they told us we were screwed when we took it into the bar, but no, we got an answer and a patent for it. You know. So uh, here's... This ridiculous thing they came up. Oh, the you mean which which um type? I'll have to look it up. We have a number now. Yeah. All right. Financial status and report. So if you can you can find them like in hot California businesses. As I mentioned before, they used to be called Annadale. Um, this was a list of other, among other companies, including Intel and National. So this was like, they were, you know, they were, they were a noticed, noted company. They were headquarters in Pasadena, and uh, they were on the NASDAQ. And in 1982, they made $1.9 million, um, and with a price increase of 88%. And you're like, if you're just some naive person back in 1982, you're like, whoa, that's almost as high as Intel's, 116%, right? This is a hot company. I want to be a part of it. Uh, maybe not though. Their stock price hit something like a buck eighty-eight. Um, their earnings per share was were underwater, forty cents, and then fifty twenty-five cents. They're taking a six hundred sixty thousand uh, dollar loss here, again with a market cap of about three one three point one million dollars. And you can see the registration and everything. So it's really interesting to think that they had that kind of momentum to go IPO on that thing. But then in nineteen eighty-two. Uh, even as they're reporting profits, it's really fun to go in the New York Times and find in their back issues, micropin articles, but here, here's one of them. 
Um, you know, they again get this revenue of $1.3 million, but then they're going to buy Elcon Industries. And I'll show you some of the games they'll know. You'll, you'll know. But to take, take things in the, into consideration, if I put $1.3 million on 200 machines, you think these are making $128 a machine a week? Not impossible. Not impossible. You know, it's, it's games making $50, $100 a week. Not un unbelievable. But I think that's baloney. I think that the video game, the pinball crash, and the, the dawning of video games hit, and this is all Elcon revenue. They gave one quarter of their shares, by the way, to buy Elcon. And some of the famous games you may remember from Elcon, Cosmic Attackers, Tennis, Soccer, Hockey, Blockbuster, and, and other forgotten games. So this was their hope, I think, to resurrect themselves from the, the failing micropin industry. Here's the Elcon weird mis... mis uh, can I ask a question? Yeah, question. Can't change the slide yet. This one? Yeah. Yeah. Is that really year zero? Or yes, so yes. Uh, that was a game Jesus was playing. Oh. Um, yeah. mm -hmm. um, when you come to conventions like these, it's important to find the right transportation. A bell cart works great. <laughs> As you can see here, we didn't get one today. but um, And then just I'll wrap up and I'll um, stop talking. This is what the inside looks like. So. You know, where does the motherboard live? This, there's not enough room for all the circuitry up here. Up here has enough room for the power supply, the scoreboards, and, um, and the operator console, of course. The down here, you can see here's all the, the RAM, the Intel part, the ROMs are down here. Uh, there's some hand-wired little blue um, factory improvements down there. Ken actually has the um, display board here to show. But I guess the takeaway from this is like, they are hard to work on. Uh, the, the, these take time to actually disassemble and get used to, and you feel nervous doing it, given there's only 200 of them. Um, and no schematics. And if you look at the back of this, it looks hand soldered. This is not, you see all the residue from the plugs. It's, not, oh, sorry. If you look at the back of this, this board is obviously hand soldered because there's lots of flux residue left. Yeah, sure. It wasn't done in a leaf solder machine or anything like that. So. Um, looks like they're even hand built. It's it's just amazing to me that they're um, made 200 this way. Could, could you could you tell us what what year the board was made? Uh, 1980, I think. That's okay. somewhere around 80. Says one of these boards somewhere. This one's serial number 89. But yeah, I don't see a date on this one. But it's I can look at the dates on the chips. Hold on, I'm getting old. Well, come up later. We'll, we'll look how some of the better eyes can read it later. Right. I just want to say one thing about the display board, which is I'm looking up parts, right? My, I have a 74 or something part that's broken on. But in the process, I'm looking up the display board. Do you know who manufactured those score displays? Hewlett Packard made those displays, the little the yeah. LEDs, those seven segments, right? Can you imagine the company that now sells printer ink making actually some useful bit of electronics that you could buy? <laughs> What? And they weren't cheap displays. I used to work at HP and uh, I had some of the uh, catalogs off of the Opto division and they were not cheap displays, so they obviously were not concerned about cutting costs. So anyway, I think that's, that's all I've dug up about MicroPen, at least that I'm going to present today. Uh, I really love the MicroPen little uh, corner of the hobby. It's fun. Um, they're hard to find, however, uh, but they just, I just keep finding these own interesting tidbits and again this combination of like being ahead of their time. Oh, I forgot to mention the timeline. Another thing they're ahead of their time on. A little fun trivia question for our pinball nerds in here. So why did I include 8-Ball in this picture? <coughs> trivia, who knows? Why, why would 8-Ball why would be a game I'd care about in this picture? Also known as Fonzie in Ohio. Yes, Jerry? Not digital sound. Good guess, though. That still has chimes. Digital yes. Digital score. No. They, uh, Matahari, Amiibo, Knievel. All there. there was something about this Valley game that was the first ever of its type. And uh, now I know we have a great question for the next, when we have our pinball trivia. Again. Eight Ball was the first game to remember what you had in a multiplayer game. 
Every other game just was like an EM. And like, next ball, reset the relays and start over. Eight ball would remember what balls you have. And the reason I have that error is, we used, at least some of us, maybe it was just me, used to think like that was a big deal, right? That was like a milestone in pinball. Um, they already had it. They beat them to the punch. So I find it fun to find out all these weird quirks and things that they came up with ahead of their time. And that's, that's what I got. So I want to talk a little bit more about um, acquiring these games. It is very hard to get these games. And we, everyone I know has gotten one to a different venue. It's not as simple as, um, well, he got lucky and found eBay. My eBay search has found me nothing. Actually, it did find me the display board. But um, for me, I got lucky because I was um, set up on a VAPS, the Video Arcade Preservation Society, where you can list the games you want and the games you have. And so I listed two games under what I wanted. One was Micropin, the other was the upgrade ROM to my Ferrari game downstairs. And um, I did finally get the upgrade ROM not through VAPS, but one day out of the blue I got an email, somebody had a Micropin, and they're looking for someone to sell it to. And they went to VAPS, and they found my, looking at, I had it listed as a wanted, and they sent me an email saying, are you interested? And I wrote back to me and said, yes, I am very interested. Um, he was up in Oregon, in Portland, and there was one other person interested, but that person wanted him to ship it. He's like, I really don't want to ship it. And I said, I will drive up to Oregon and get it. <laughs> so I, I took three days. I have a friend that's uh, about three hours south of Portland, so I went and stayed with him and then drove up and got the game. Um, it was working just fine when I got it. it. He mentioned the battery issue. For me, I had to plug it in, let it sit for 10 minutes, and then I got happy. Um, now, we transported it here today, and the right flipper doesn't work, and the display's got a loose connection in it now, and it has a special bike and screw to take it apart and open it up, and I, my bit, right here in my pocket, well, it broke off trying to open it up today, so, and then I went to the store, and the guy's like, oh, they're back ordered from China for six months, so, yeah, at the moment, I cannot get in and fix my game, but it is downstairs if you want to see it, and uh, I will have it working again soon enough. Um, but it's, it's, um, if you want one of these games, you have to search, use every venue possible, and, um, and just keep hoping and looking. Um, one of the things, the guy I bought mine from, his father-in-law worked for the company back in the um, late 70s, and he actually, you know, I think he got the game as part of his compensation. I think you mentioned also someone, an investor, basically lost his money in investment, but got a game out of it, so. Um, so I, 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 I have the Kai's contact information. He's unfortunately on, on vacation right now. I actually called him this morning, but terrible cell phone connection. So I do hope to soon get an interview with the guy and learn more. And are you going to make your slide deck available? Put it up somewhere? Yeah, so we can add to the slide deck and make it, you know, it's, it's Google Docs, so you can just keep adding to it. It's beautiful. Um, so we intend to, like, you know, make it better as time goes on and get more information out there because it is a very interesting game, very fascinating, and it's actually also very fun to play. So. Um, that's pretty much all I have. We have to talk about here. But uh, if you have any questions, please ask. You first. Uh, what would you value that at? Right there, that one. With the lamp and everything, like all that. What would you value that at? Not what you would sell it for, but value it. Well, it's one of those things where I like having it, and I can't buy another one. So it, even right. though it's not really worth what I would want, you know. Uh, but I can tell you other people have spent somewhere around fifteen hundred thousand, two thousand. Uh, one guy got one at a garage sale for five bucks. Wow. So I've been told. Um, the investor, as Ken alluded, oh, that's right. Yeah. I bought it from an investor who lost all his money and said, oh, well, I'm going to get something out of this and showed up and got this and got the lamp too. Thank, thank goodness for that. Um, but. Uh, and he said he knew some, another guy had theirs and let it go to the garage sale. So they're out there somewhere, you know, they're, and, and they probably didn't get thrown away. Um, you know, I am kind of nervous taking it to the show because it's so portable, right? Like some of them walk off with it. But uh, so I'll, I'll tell you what I paid for mine. It's um, the guy, you know, sent me an email and said, please make an offer. So I offered him a thousand dollars. And he said, well, I got this guy in Southern California, and he wants he was willing to pay more, but he wants me to ship it. I don't want to ship it. He's, he's, his quote was, can you offer a little bit more? And I wrote back and said, does 1300 count as a little bit more? And he said, okay. So $1,300 and three days and all the gas money to get up there is what I paid for it. Um, I think I got a smoking deal, to be honest. I've wanted one for a while. I've been searching for years. Uh, so uh, what's it, you know, what was it worth? As any collector, 
collectible item, it's worth what a collectible pay for it. Um, but you know, I, you know, as you said, one to two thousand dollars seems not unreasonable, and you're not going to make a fortune from these things. It's not like this, you know, again, supply and demand, very limited supply, and also limited demand. So you're not going to have this, you know, oh, I got one of one, and it's still worth two thousand bucks. So, um, but yeah, so it's look out there, you can find them. Um, just keep looking, 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 and get lucky, sir. So uh, I've never heard it before, so. Uh, I guess the most the obvious joke. Do you guys call it the DeLorean of pinball machines? <laughs> uh, I never have, but I may. Maybe it will start because it yeah. is it's a good idea. Thank yeah. you. Stainless yeah. steel. Yeah. I mean, yeah. it seems so obvious. I thought, wow. And, and we can make a time machine out of it. <laughs> I don't know if drugs were involved, but uh, <laughs> but maybe they were, and then it'd be even better now. <laughs> and then, so when did the company go out of business completely? They're still in business as of 82, because I have um, their quarterly report on that one. Um, and I'm going to go and see if I can get any more uh, reports signed. It's funny when you read this one, though, because um, they're fairly optimistic about their future. Uh, even though they say in the report they're done making this. Like, the game from which their name comes is over. But we bought this third-rate company that no one has ever heard of. And, uh, and that's our bright future into the video market. So. You kind of get that sense, you know, it's kind of like if your mom started a video game company, it's like it would have certain elements that are correct, but then it'd be like, hey, you know, this isn't, wouldn't it be interesting to have a game with clowns? It's like, no, mom, people want aliens, not clowns. Um, so, yes. Yeah, this seems like, this seems like it's kind of like aliens who have a vague understanding of what pinball is, but don't really, who sell it, but don't really have yes. heard of pinball machines, but have never actually seen one. Exactly, exactly, yeah, it's like an alien... Yeah, it's exactly that. You got it. Have you ever looked at any court documents? I, 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 I did a bit of reading on this, and uh, it seems that maybe in California they may have triggered the uh, gambling laws because of the scoring system on that. I read that. Um and I read that they were in hot water because Elcon, the people they bought, were in trouble with something to do with Crazy Kong. So I don't know if Elcon did their own Crazy Kong knockoff of a knockoff or something like that, but they inherited, and they mentioned that in their, their, um, their quarterly report, that they were still in some legal hot water. But I'm not sure if it's gambling. Gambling's always been a weird thing. Like, I worked, side story since we are early. Um, I worked at Williams back in the 90s, and I made a physical version of Breakout prototype, which sort of turned into the little feature on Shadow, right? And I showed that to Steve Kordak one day, and I'm expecting to get that big attaboy, like, hey, 19-year-old future pinball genius, yeah, awesome, right? And he's like, I don't know, you see, because the gambling people, they're going to wonder about this, right? So th there was always this halo of, like, we got in trouble because the bingo machines and all that. So, um, and, and, and I'm sure that was the thing yeah, for them, too. If you look at the scoring system on the back, it Kind of could be interpreted as a uh, a made for gambling uh, setup. Might be worth looking at some portal. Yeah. You can also play it on vi Visual Pin Mame. I think it's V1 is on there. Oh, it's V1 because nobody, nobody figured out V2 yet. Board wise, at least, yeah. The ROMs are dumped, but yeah, there's no ROM. Um, so no one knows that anything like that yet. Another one? Oh, go. Yes. Been made a design, you designed a physical version of Breakout? Yes. Were you a pinball flipper, or did you try to replicate the sliding car? I took the car from Police Force, right? That slider mechanism, and I mounted a slingshot on it, and then I had a bunch of drop targets. That's V1. And again, if you play Shadow, it has the same kind of thing, right? The tricky part, this isn't a breakout part, even though breakout is the most significant game ever, um, <clears throat> which is true. Um, it, the problem with breakout versus video breakout is when the ball just sort of lingers on the slingshot. In real breakout, the ball moves itself. But if that ball doesn't have enough to trigger the switch, it just kind of lingers there. So there's, there's some trickiness to get that to feel right. And you know, when Steve Kordak ripped on me for my not having gone to the legal department and talking about gambling, I sort of let that one fly, and then Brian Eddy brought it to life.
Well, if you guys want to play Macro Pin, um, this is the only one working right now that we know of, so come on up and play. Mine will be working again soon, but not yet. So, so come on up and enjoy the game. Oh, no, to tell you how to play it. So, there's plenty of credits. To launch the ball, you press the right flipper. There you go.
Well, okay, yeah. Apparently, if you're around six foot, you almost hit your head on the leg. Yeah, I noticed that. Point of the point of the drawback. I didn't notice. Yeah, they're showing. Uh, but it's so what is the wire with the foot pedal so that they can they're playing and they can they can give them the Chris and they can walk around the back and go like this and go back to the front. Yeah, that's my guess. Yeah, that was great. Yeah, see the foot pedal means you're doing this. Maybe the lights wouldn't be playing. The lights turn off. Somewhere I've got a picture, but um, okay. Oh, that's fair. Do you, do you have a slide thing available? Is that the one? Sure. Uh, I don't so understand. So the one that the version one yeah, down there. Yeah. 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 Well, it seems like there was more information at the interface. You want to give me your email and uh, somewhere that I can forward you? I'm not on the internet here. Yeah, yeah. Can you imagine the cost? I wish it was just some ploy and actually got a mill out. Let's nail the mill. I don't know. To even do that process sure. like that. Uh, I got a great suggestion. Make them double sided next time, right? Oh, and then you can write stuff in there, yeah. No, I thought it was no, going to be like a laser contraction. You can have a graphic. Oh, so you can see the name, yeah. Yeah, that would have been too bad. Walking around like you would blame. There's two answers there because it's basically going to go there and switch it to the back. It's like Murphy's Law, too. Yeah, but then run. Oh. oh, I don't know, you know. Well, here, wait, uh, I have my computer. I could just, like, open up Notepad and you could just tell me. Having, like, operated before and uh, working with bar owners, it's just, like, a terrible idea to have the bar owner put the credits in because they're always having to make change and break change. So, um, All right, let's remail. The pinball machine in the corner. Right there. It's not really much. Coffee, None of the places I put um, any dive bars. Like that? So they're always. Yeah. Wow. 
Lamb. Yeah. 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 Yeah.